Welcome to Stolen From Me. I'm your host, Lindsay, and bi-weekly, I'll be bringing you a true crime episode. So, if you are under the age of 13, I'm really sorry, but this is not the podcast for you. If you're over the age of 13, I suggest you pop in your headphones and get comfortable. If you'd like to leave me a review, you can do so by popping on to my Twitter page and clicking on the link in the bio. You will find it will take you to all your favourite platforms. And if you can go on to Apple, you can leave me a five star review and subscribe. That would be fantastic. And if you have any recommendations, then you can pop onto my website, which is uh, stolenfrommepod.com. And there's a form on there that you can fill out and you can send me any suggestions. I'll be forever grateful for that. If you wait till the end of this episode, you will hear a wonderful promo from the wonderful Three Spooked Girls. They are a true crime and spooky podcast every monday and thursday they release new episodes the hosts are jessica and tara and you don't want to miss it you can go on to their twitter page at three spooked girls and enjoy this episode like i say has a disclaimer and it is gruesome so just beware if you don't want to listen to something like this so this is the case of rachel nickel Rachel was full of life. She was creative, well-loved, passionate. She had an excellent singing voice. She was a natural performer. She studied and received her English degree. She was besotted with her two-year-old son, Alex, and her partner, Andre. They had a dog called Molly, who they loved. Rachel just genuinely really loved her life and loved her family. On the 15th of July, 1992, Rachel decided to take Molly for a walk over Wimbledon Common. Now, Wimbledon Common, if you don't know it, it's in London. It's a popular place for people to go out to walk their children, um, get exercise, walk their dogs. Their children can just run around and just, you know, be happy. Um, It's a large open space with 1,140 acres. It's just a really popular location where a lot of people went out to exercise and just sit over there and have a sort of a nice relaxing day really. But this day was not going to be one of those. So there was nothing unusual about Rachel walking her dog over there or even taking her little son Alex over there because they loved the Wimbledon Commons. And the day that she decided to do so... She was walking happily along the commons with her son Alex and dog Molly. A man come running up to Rachel, slashed her throat. He slashed her throat so deep it almost decapitated her. He went on to stab Rachel over 40 times and sexually assault her, all in front of her two-year-old son Alex. The attacker left the scene. Michael Murray, he was a retired architecture, he came round the corner and thought he saw someone sunbathing. As he moved closer, he saw Rachel, a semi-naked, unresponsive person with a hysterical son. They were both covered in blood. Alex was trying to wake his mummy up, screaming at his mummy, wake up mummy, wake up mummy. The police arrived at the scene. They cordoned it off. Knowing that the commons was 1,140 acres of land and roughly around 500 people was on the commons that morning, they didn't really have many clues to go on. Uh, There was very little forensic evidence at the scene. Uh, They didn't even know if the killer was a male or a female. I mean, the only thing they had was little Alex. He had a speck of red paint in his hair. Uh, he, He was only two, and yet he was actually the one witness there was. The police knew that this was a horrendous crime, and they had to act fast because 
you know, this person could and would strike again. Andre received a call nobody wants to receive. He had a call from the police explaining what had happened to Rachel. He went to the police station in pieces, as you would expect. He then went to collect Alex from the hospital. The police actually thought by doing an appeal on telly with Andre that the, the investigation, it might help her. So they did this, but sadly nothing really come of it. So one morning, Alex and Andre was drawing and Andre asked Alex if he was drawing a fat man or a thin man. Alex responded to his daddy and within minutes, he actually came up with a sketch. I mean, this was a massive breakthrough for police. Andre was clearly devastated over Rachel. I mean, this was the, the loveliest couple you can think of, you know, they had a really happy family and, you know, a little son and a little dog and a lovely little life going on. So could you imagine just losing your partner in the most worst way and knowing your son loved his mum so much? What, you know, you, you're heartbroken. You're not thinking clearly. And Andre clearly wasn't thinking. And he thought the best thing for his son and him was to commit suicide. Now, Andre said to the newspaper that he did think this and he was intending to commit suicide with himself and his son. But he actually asked Alex, do we want to keep going on? And Alex, just nearly three years old, said, yes, I do. And thank goodness he said that because they didn't go through with it. So 12 miles away from Wimbledon Commons, the same man was terrorising women with their children. A woman had been violently beaten, raped in front of her child. She begged him not to hurt her child. He went on to attack three more victims in Green Chain Walk. The attacker fled the scene again. The police brought on Paul Britton. He's a profiler. He came in to have a look at the investigation, try and build a profile on who this person was. And he was hoping, you know, they'll catch him. So all this time, you know, he built up this profile and they thought, you know, something might become of it. Um, even though the killer had, let, had fled the scene with Rachel, went down the stream, washed his hands, and then the same thing that happened with the green chain attacks. A woman was attacked with her child and the man went down to the stream and washed his hands. Uh, there was no connection. Paul Britain did not connect this. A sketch, what they made, which was Andre and Alex made, and then with the profile of Paul Britain, what he came up with, they put it on TV and did a TV appeal to see if they could get anyone who recognised this person, who, you know, any information they could. So they did that. This actually brought several phone calls in and they all gave one name. And this name was Colin Stagg. Even though the police did actually follow up on other leads, they had many other leads, um, but nothing actually came of these leads. So they kind of fixated on Colin Stagg. The only man left in sight was Colin and this was going to be the case for the next two years. They went straight round and arrested Colin with circumstantial evidence. They searched his property and found relating things to the case. So he had knives there, like cultic knives. He had an occult book. Um, he was kind of had a little dark side as well. So, you know, they just put two and two together and said right okay you're the man 
They took Colin to the police station and held him there for three days. A very honest but slightly naive, I'd say, Colin admitted to sunbathing naked over the commons once when a woman told police that Colin actually exposed herself to him. But Colin said that he had always sunbathed every year in the same spot. It's where people go to sunbathe naked and he admitted it freely to him and he got fined basically £200. So the police took this and ran, ran like the wind with it. Uh, Colin said two years previously to this, he answered like in the newspaper back in the day, you would have um, like ads uh, for friendship or dating and you could respond to these ads and then obviously hopefully find someone you know and build a connection with so this is what Colin was actually hoping for Julie Pine um, and Colin spoke on the phone they wrote letters Colin decided to try his luck basically and write Julia a sexual letter and having sort of tried this Julia nothing really come of them two but Julia actually kept the letter for two years and then when she heard about Colin had been arrested she basically took the letter to police and because Rachel Nickel was killed in such a violent way with knives and just sexually assaulted and it was just awful and then with what they found at Colin's flat they basically was 100% certain this was the man you know so the morning of Rachel's murder Colin walked his dog he actually walked his dog over the commons but he actually went home because he had a really bad migraine and he thought um, if I take a tablet, I'll take a painkiller, have a nap. Have a, After the nap, if I feel better, I'll go out and take my dog for another walk. And that's exactly what he did. He literally went home, went to sleep, popped some pills, woke up, went back out to take his dog for a walk. And then as he was walking over the commons, he saw a police officer. And he said to the police officer, what's going on? You know, I've you know, what's happening over here? And he said, I'm sorry, sir, but you can't actually go any further. There's been an incident. Um, and Colin said, what do you mean an incident? I was over here a little while ago. Uh, and the police officer said, oh, right, OK, well, we've found a body. And they took, or actually Colin volunteered his name and address and number. He didn't think anything of it, because obviously you just want to help when something so bad has happened. And that's what he did. So now, with Colin being arrested, because that was what he did in the morning, and that put him at the place of the scene, so so Colin now arrested for Rachel's murder, and even though there was no evidence of him and the connection with Rachel, the, they obviously kept him for three days, but then they released him. So the police, the next step, with the help of Paul, the profiler, they actually brought in, this is Paul Britton's idea again, he's such a clever man. Um, they brought in a female police officer. Back then, we're talking about 1992, this is actually what they used to do. And so her name was Lizzie James, and they wanted a honey trap, basically. So Operation Edsel began. They wanted Lizzie to basically write to Colin, gain his trust and confess to the killing of Rachel. They wanted to trip Colin up and admit this murder all in these letters. Uh, but Colin didn't do that. Colin shared sexual fantasies, sometimes violent fantasies with Lizzie. Not having any type of sexual relationship with a woman this is Colin, he actually would say anything to Lizzie that she wanted to hear. But not once, not one time, did he admit 
to kill and Rachel. He admitted to violent sexual relationships like that he would want with her and things like that, but not once did he admit to Rachel. Even though when Lizzie said she would really love to have sex with the person who actually killed Rachel, Colin always maintained his innocence. He would always ask Lizzie, is this what you really want? And she would always be the one that started the violent fantasies. Colin was 29 years old and still a virgin. He had no experience. He just thought someone really liked him, you know, so he was just going to basically say whatever she wanted him to say. Colin did later admit that he was actually really scared that no one didn't actually believe him. Lizzie James and Colin ended up meeting in Hyde Park. This was this Colin was completely unaware that there was undercover officers everywhere. Um he he didn't know. He just saw Lizzie and was excited, you know. Actually she said she had a dark secret. She actually admitted and said to Colin that she was involved with a man, another man, and they had a kind of dark, sadistic, sadinist, I think the word is, I can't say it. Um, and it turned out that she confessed to killing a pregnant woman and the baby on an altar. She thought that this was going to be like, oh yeah, this is great because obviously she picked a baby and the mother because the profile was some crazy man killing mothers and baby or attacking people who was with their children so they were mothers Colin actually thought she was bullshitting he didn't believe her for one second but he fancied her so the police and Paul Britton still didn't get the confession they wanted the police didn't seem to really care about this and re-arrested Colin on August the 17th, 1993. They even dug up the poor man's garden. Now, this is when Colin discovered Lizzie James was an actual copper. She, decided, he, she walked in, basically, in the interview, and he saw she was a police officer. It must be actually really devastating, because I know he said that he felt humiliated, um... Because you would, wouldn't you? If you gained all this trust, these police officers were all sitting in a room with him, reading intimate details of letters that them two had shared. And he generally thought she fancied him and wanted to be with him. And now he just realised that was, you know, they were all taking the piss out of him, basically, and setting him up. So by this time, he obviously knew that they were setting him up. Colin said all he kept thinking about was... This was a murder charge. You need evidence for a murder charge. And they didn't have one scrap of evidence linking him to the crime. He said, he, you can't put an innocent man in prison for writing dirty letters to, to a woman who actually asked him to write the letters. But Colin was charged with the murder of Rachel and police put him in custody. The police called... Andre and broke the news and said the killer has been caught. Now, could you imagine, Andre, <laughs> you're not going to feel great, are you? But you're going to feel some sense of relief that the person who did this horrendous crime to your partner is been locked up. You know, you're going to feel some kind of relief. Um, all the time that this was happening, Rachel's Rachel actual killer her actual killer was on the loose and he is described as actually the modern day Jack the Ripper he had the similar traits to Jack the Ripper although I'm going to call them sex workers um, Jack the Ripper obviously attacked and killed sex workers but Napa the actual killer he would attack mums with their kiddies there. The police were so wrapped up in Colin that they actually missed vital clues to the real killer. And in autumn 1993, he was about to strike again. 
In the summer of 1989, there was a brutal rape in Plumstead in safe east London, marking a series of rapes and a four-year streak of attacks. A lady was getting her children ready for school and she had her back door wide open. She was drying her hair as you do and a man standing there with a knife and a balaclava over his face showered and she didn't know what to do and he raped her. This was the start of the Green Chain attacks, which on the Green Chain Walk in safe London, that's, was, that's where they all happened. That's obviously why they're called the Green Chain Walks. So they went, they went on for numerous years, numerous years, and no one was caught for them. Sadly, the first attack could have actually been after the first attack, could have been prevented as the police did actually receive a phone call about the Plumstead rape. It's unbelievable that Robert Knapper's own mother went to the police and said her son just admitted to raping a woman, which he did say he did do it, um... The police looked into this. It was not in the correct location as what she said, as in something else happening, and the police said, no, basically nothing's happened. One of the worst killers they have ever seen could have been stopped. Okay, so just before Rachel was actually murdered, Robert Knapper actually attacked a woman. She was pushing her baby in the pushchair. He jumped out at her, pushed her to the floor and tried to strangle her. Again in front of her child. The lady was brutally raped. All while she was screaming to leave her alone and get off her. With this attack and what would be Rachel's attack, they were so similar and the police didn't link them together or should we say Paul Britton. He was working on the case. He was the profiler. He didn't um, put them together because he was actually working on all three cases. Um, The police put an e-fit out in 1992 with, and two people actually came forward. One was Robert Knapper's neighbour and another one was just someone who actually knew Robert Knapper. So they actually asked Robert Knapper for a DNA test to come in on two occasions. Two occasions, okay? He didn't turn up twice, obviously. So the police sent a couple of police officers round. They're said to be uh, just on the job. They only just started, basically. I don't know if that's true or not, but a few places I've read that they were just rookies. They were only new. And you'll see why. Because they went round to speak to Napa and find out, you know, why have you not turned up for your DNA test? You know, you're supposed to come on two occasions. The police officer looked at Robert Napa. There and then on the spot, just looking at him in the doorway and thought, this man is two inches too tall. He can't be our man. He's definitely not linked to the green chain investigations. He was too tall by two inches. Now, how can you look at someone and think you're two inches too tall, so therefore you didn't commit these murders where not really anyone saw you, so they've got this kind of sketch of what they think you might look like, but this sketch would say that you're two inches too tall, so you didn't do this. Well done, police officers. Crack and job. Fifteen months after Rachel Nicholson's murder and Colin was awaiting trial, another attack happened. What was about to happen is truly heartbreaking and 
If you don't want to listen to this bit, then I suggest you skip it about 15 seconds. Not a really a lot get to me, I must admit. I am pretty sort of, I don't know what it word is, but not really a lot of cases get to me. There's James Bulger case I can't even read because it's horrendous. I will not ever cover that. And I've read her book, James Bulger's mum's book, and it's so heartbreaking. Um, but this part of the episode really actually got to me. So if you don't want to listen to it, just skip forward. I haven't written full details down because it was just horrible. So Saman Samantha Bissett lived with her four-year-old daughter, Jasmine, and her boyfriend, Conrad, said that he lived there. But some places say he didn't live there, so I'm not really sure. In Plumstead, South East London. Now, a few weeks earlier, Samantha actually told Conrad, someone's been looking through my window and I'm feeling a bit creepy. And Cullen actually said that she used to, she's quite a free spirit, she used to walk around naked in her flat, you know, but forget to draw, she, no, she didn't actually have curtains. So he said, you know, stop it. You know, there's a lot of weirdos out there. You don't really want to do it. And she did actually feel uncomfortable about this and did stop. So Conrad walked into Samantha's uh, in the morning and he explained what he found. So there were stains on the carpets, okay? In, in the kitchen, Samantha used to have her clothes in the cupboard. They were all thrown over the floor. He then saw Samantha lying on the sofa covered in clothes, like loads of clothes. And then he sort of was a bit, what's going on? He thought she might be dead because he said that she didn't look right and he didn't want to go back into the room. So his obviously his gut feeling is telling him that this is not right. Um, and then he realised, where's Jasmine? He went into Jasmine's bedroom and four-year-old Jasmine was in her bed covered up as well. It said that Jasmine had been raped and murdered. She was strangled. Four-year-old Jasmine. Now, Samantha... This is so sad. Um, Samantha... He stabbed her, I think, about 60 times. But he actually removed part of her body and kept it as a souvenir. Now, and then he placed her body in a position, you know, and then covered her up. The police actually said, this is one of the worst scenes that they've ever seen. In fact, a couple of police officers who was actually there to take photographs took two years off because they just couldn't go back to it. Samantha's body was basically just hacked to bit to bits. And that poor lady and her poor poor daughter what she'd been through because the police are so crap at their job sometimes. I'm I'm not saying always because they're not always. Sometimes they're just brilliant at their job and they really do a, a brilliant job. But not on this case. No way. This could have been prevented. And the police started to think that the case could actually be linked to the green chain attack. Conrad, Conrad went on to appeal. He appealed... He actually appealed to the killer. He wanted the killer to write to him and tell him why he did this. Um, that oh, is so heartbreaking. That really gets to me, that do. The police uh, brought Paul Britton in again. Come back. Uh, he was actually involved in the green chain rapes, Samantha's murder and Rachel's murder. And he still didn't link any of them together, the profiler. So Robert Knapper was free to do what he wanted. He 
just told the police what sort of person would commit these horrendous crimes. This was um, Paul Britton. And he said he knew the type of person wouldn't relate to women. He was a loner. Maybe he had a low IQ. Um, and the police officer said they already know this. It's what all the psychologists, or, you know, they all say that sort of thing to when they come near a killer. It's the childhood, blah, blah, blah. This is what happened. And this is the sort of person that did it. But yet he still didn't make any links. So Mickey Banks was just about to get a breakthrough. They found fingerprints at Samantha's flat and Robert Knapper actually left a footprint as well. So at Samantha's flat, they actually found six fingerprints, all matching to Robert Knapper because Robert Knapper had pre previously been arrested and his fingerprints were on file. So they put two and two together finally. After so many missed clues, eight missed clues to be honest, they were on the radar all this time, eight clues, right? They still didn't put it together. But in 1994, Mickey Banks charged Napper with the murder of Samantha and Jasmine. But in 1992, going back, Napa was actually arrested for stalking. So when he was arrested for stalking, they went to Robert Napa's flat and searched it. They found an A to Z book um, placed with mark, they, there was marked spots all around Plumstead Commons, you know, the Wimbledon Commons section, and also comments in the book about women being abused and covered in cling film and violence attacks to these women. So, with... We're going to jump forward again. With the fingerprints that they found and the footprint matching Robert Napper's shoes, he was seen at the place where it, where it happened. He was actually seen washing his hands as well in the stream. 1994, Napa was charged with the murders and he was also proven that he was green chain rapist. Napa was also charged with two rapes and two attempted rapes along green chain walk. Colin Stagg in 1994 in September was released from prison after 14 months. The case against Colin was thrown out of court from the judge he described it as a honey trap, the evidence was indismissible and he was disgusting. Actually, the judge was disgusted, absolutely disgusted and was really angry with the police on how they treated Colin for having absolutely no evidence whatsoever. But Colin, when he left the court, you know, when he got thrown out of court, he was mobbed by press. They wouldn't leave him alone because he was then deemed, although it was thrown out of court for no evidence, he was then deemed the man that got away with murder. And he spent the next 14 years as a social outcast. Now, Rachel's family were now obviously looking for answers. They wanted to know who the hell killed their daughter and girlfriend, you know. They wanted these answers. The green chain killer and rapist was about to be sentenced. Napa showed absolutely no emotion. I mean, none, not, 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 one, not one piece of emotion. To the murders, to the numerous attacks on women, Napa was sentenced to Broadmoor indefinitely for the murder of Samantha and Little Jasmine. He admitted manslaughter on the ground of diminished responsibility, as they always do. Napa's childhood, okay, uh, he was bullied and he was classed as an actual vulnerable child. Now, at an early age, it was actually said that Robert Knapp was actually sexually assaulted by someone close to him, which is not surprising, not being awful or anything, but this does happen and people do grow up to do these terrible things. Not everyone, because 
I'm not the person that likes people to say and blame their childhood for things. But it's true. You know, they he was sexually assaulted by someone close to him. The person who it was, although it's not said who it was, actually went to prison for it. Robert Napa has Asperger's. He's also uh, schizophrenic. Um, with DNA testing in 2002, there was a small speck of uh, DNA on Rachel's jogging pants and furthermore testing uh, with the speck of paint, remember, on Alex's hair that was at the scene when Rachel actually got murdered. Remember, there was paint in little Alex's hair matched Robert Knapper's metal toolbox. This actually proved that Napa was in contact with Rachel on the day of her murder. Now, finally, after 16 years, the family saw the man in court who had killed their beloved partner and mother. Napa is in top security prison in Broadmoor, and he actually remains in there for the rest of his life. He will never, ever get out of there. Um, the court... The judge said that he will never, ever leave. And new evidence has since come to light. And it was in 1993, a knife was found in Wimbledon Common. The knife was actually matched to Napa. And at the time, in 1993, when they found it, they didn't actually connect him to Rachel again. So this is another piece of evidence that would have connected him to the murders, what they chose to ignore so the judge did say that Napa would be held indefinitely in Broadmoor Hospital for the horrific crimes of Rachel and Samantha and Jasmine. Now, Alex and Andre, they live in France and they've had a relatively good life, if you can say good life, without the mother being around. I mean, Andre has done a fantastic job bringing up Alex. Alex is a well-rounded, lovely boy. He's done an interview on TV, which I watched, and he really is such a nice lad. He said that he could actually still remember her, his mother being murdered. Now, that's so sad. He was only, I think, a couple of weeks off three years old, and he still has that memory. So even though internal inquiries show that the cost of hounding Colin and arresting him and putting him into prison, it actually cost the public £3 million, unbelievably, for an innocent man. Colin was actually awarded £700,000 and had a public apology off the police which probably didn't mean shit to him, to be honest. Um, Lizzie James, remember the female officer who wrote all the letters, she said this actually ruined her whole career. And I think, I don't know if she was pushed into doing it or what, but she said that it ruined her career and she was awarded £125,000 out of court settlement. So... So this is Stolen From Me, and this is dedicated to Rachel Napper, Samantha Bissett, and Colin Stagg, and all of Robert Napper's victims. It's actually said in numerous places, I've looked all over the internet and on documentaries, it's said that he actually raped and attacked in front of children around 70 to 120 people. And obviously the police didn't have a clue. So this is dedicated to everyone affected by Robert Napper. Now don't forget to listen to the promo at the end of this episode, which is Three Spooked Girls. Thank you and I'll see you soon. Hey there, I'm Tara. And I'm Jessica. And together we co-host the podcast Three Spooked Girls. If you love the paranormal. Or murder. 
Join us on Mondays for full-length episodes where we discuss our favorite paranormal stories and true crime cases. And join us again on Thursdays for our mini-sodes called Stabby Snippets, where we tell you all about true crimes happening in the news. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, or wherever the hell else you listen to your pods at. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook by using the handle at 3SpookedGirls. Come and hang out with us and get your spooky on while we scare the hell out of you.